Good evening. This is the second programme in our series of excerpts from Review. It'll have a song from Linda Hoyle, and its theme is painters. The first of them is Man Ray, the 82-year-old American painter, photographer and Dadaist, who's lived in Paris since 1921. One of the things he's most famous for is creating witty and irreverent objects. And in fact, the idea of Dadaism was to destroy the artistic preconceptions of the past and so clear the way for something new. We have three excerpts from our original film of Man Ray, those sections devoted to his objects, his photographs and his friends. Everything I do has a sense, has a meaning. And if you don't get it, I can tell you what it is, that much. object is something fascinating, a mystery to me, because it survives. And even if it disappears, there's always a record of it, a record of it in the form of a photograph or a painting. An object is a result of looking at something which in itself has no quality or charm. I pick something which in itself has no meaning at all, but I combine it with a second element, like I combine here, two or three things. I got a stand that held test tubes for chemists. I had a piece of plastic tubing, and the holes in this and the length of the tubing suggests the composition that I'm going to make. And then there were little uh, concave hollows in the bottom of this stand, so I had to fill them up so much. I thought, well, marbles would be the thing. It's always a, a very visual and logical project that makes me do the object. I disregard completely the aesthetic quality of the object. I'm against craftsmanship. I say the world is full of wonderful craftsmen, but there are very few practical dreamers. In the early days in Paris, when I first came over, and I passed by a hardware shop and I saw a flat iron in the window, I said, there's an object which is almost invisible. Maybe I could do something with that. What could I do is to add something in it that was provocative. So I got a box of tacks. I glued on a row of tacks to it to make it useless, as I thought. But nothing is really useless. You can always find a useless, even for the most extravagant object. Everyone interprets that object of mine to suit themselves, even if they don't know the title. If they accept the title with the object, 
they're a little bit bewildered sometimes. But I think that's wonderful. It should remain a mystery. Mystery should not always be solved. I've never been able to finish a detective story because I don't give a hang who was the murderer. No, no, it doesn't interest me at all. It's the process, the mental process that's involved that interests me. You see, when I painted a loaf of bread blue entirely, the idea of a title came to me immediately and almost automatically in French, pain, pain. Painted bread, because it sounds also like the kids running down the street after a fire in engine and imitating the sound of the, uh, of the siren. Pam, 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 you know? photograph the things that I don't want to paint. If a face interests me, oh, I could paint a portrait too. But it's so much quicker with a camera because, and the camera is so impersonal, whether it's a potato or the most beautiful woman in the world, you make the same movement. But when you paint your fingers, your hand follows the contours of the subject. It's much more intimate. It's almost a violation, you might say. And so I uh, photograph the things I don't want to paint, and I paint the things I cannot photograph. Something of my imagine, or the subconscious impulse, or a dream. That is reserved for painting or drawing. There's one advantage about photographing a, a painter. He accepts what I do, whereas the average run of sitters are always disappointed, mostly are, especially men, more so than women. I found out that you can satisfy, please, any woman, if you make her look young and beautiful, she properly made up and properly lit. I once photographed Lady Cunard. She ran around bringing people to me, even the uh, uh, head waiter of the Ritz Hotel, to photograph him as being one of the most important men in Europe, one of the greatest diplomats. He knew which people to put together at tables and whom to keep apart. And he would be very useful for me. But uh, I didn't think much of him myself, though, because he made a very f big faux pas with Lady Cunard. Go, won't go into detail about that. Were you very shy when you arrived in Paris? I don't know whether you would call it shyness, because I was sort of economical with my ideas and time. I wouldn't waste my time with people, so it passed for shyness or modesty. I, was, I don't think I was either of them, because I made a point of knowing the people who interested me. When I first met Brock or Picasso, I made a point of knowing them, getting familiar with them, visiting them. They came to my studio. I invited them to sit for portraits. And the whole human being came out there and then, you see. Their awkwardness in front of me, I felt like a doctor, except that they came to me when they thought they were at their best, not sick. And I felt a certain power as a photographer then. And that's what fascinated me in photography, especially, was the human face, the human reactions. Some would come and thought that they had to pose and look very uh, impressive, like I photographed Schoenberg once. They brought him around when he's coming through Paris. And he came with a celluloid collar in those days, in the 20s, and a ready-made tie. And he, I said, and he sat in front of me very stiffly, like in an old 1900 photograph, you know. I took out a black silk scarf and I put it around him where his face was absolutely isolated. And the background, everything was black. I just got the face. Now, this is going to be a permanent picture of Schoenberg. Because for years now, starting in New York, Stieglitz and Syke and the great photographers, they all try to make photography accepted on the same level as the other arts. But you couldn't. 
In the 19th century, the painters hated photography except a few, but they did it secretly, like Toulouse-Lautrec or Degas, and used it in their painting. Even Anger, after his death, they found a whole series of daguerreotypes of nudes. And Deran, the painter, used to send me his models to do nudes. He worked from the photographs. Because when he worked from the model directly, as one model came to pose him, he said, he has a very peculiar way of painting. I, I don't stand in front of him. He sits, I, I sit on his lap. And he puts his arm around me and paints with his right hand. He seems he should have been a sculptor. Not a painter. <laughs> What was Paris like when you arrived? Oh, it was, a, for me, it was a new world. I didn't speak a word of French when I came here in 21. And I felt like a newborn baby after my struggles in America and rejections from the galleries and collectors. I was immediately introduced to the whole avant-garde group, the Dadaists at the time, who were the same people who became surrealists later on, you know. But, from the very first day, Duchamp was already in Paris for a few days, for a few weeks, I suppose. And he took me around and he brought me to the cafes where I first met everybody. And they were so nice. And as I say, what I always wanted is to be accepted, not understood. First, to be accepted. But they gave all their confidence in me. I don't think I got many ideas from them, or I think I gave them as many as I got from them, there was an exchange going on all the time. That was what the contact was so important. Looking back, I always have the feeling that the, the 20s and the 30s and the Dada movement and the Surrealist movement, it, there was a, it was a great deal of fun. No, not at the time. People just look back to it and think it's a marvelous period, romantic and all that sort of thing. But no, it was very tense. It was very bitter and there was no humor in it. But what we did was really uh, to upset things, you know, but subconsciously to clear the way, as I said before, for something new which we didn't know yet what it might be. I always feel that a creator, a painter or a sculptor, whatever he does, does not work for other painters or sculptors. He works for those who do not paint. And they should accept him because they have no choice in the matter. What are the, seem to be the tricks of today will be the truths of tomorrow. I used to tell my pupils, when they ask you, how do you become original? How do you become successful? It's easy, I say, just be yourself and you will be original. Nobody will mistake your face for somebody else's face. We're all different in that sense. I'm interested in the differences between people, not the similarities. When I see a ballet and I, or a dance on the television, I'm outraged when I see two people doing the same thing, that they can keep in step together. They're regimented. I say they should go into the army then. What are you doing now? Resting. Is that all? I'm trying not to work. Oh, I'm doing something now, all right, but as I say, on the, the little note on the back of my catalog, I have never painted a re recent picture. I really mean I don't show a recent picture. If I'm doing anything now, it'll probably be shown maybe five or ten years from now, even if I'm not here. <laughs> Are you concerned about posterity? Not at all. I wish my things would disappear with me. I want to leave. I have an old daughter feeling that we must clear the fields for something new, although we don't know exactly what it may be. And the future will probably give us things which, if we saw, if we could see them today, we wouldn't understand nor accept either.
Looking back at your life, what would you say satisfied you most? I think women. <laughs> <laughs>